Hello. We begin today by acknowledging the people of the Tongva, the caretakers of this land that we now call Los Angeles. We are grateful to the Tongva and all others that stood on this land many generations ago, and we stand with them today. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Marjorie Ornston, and I represent the board of the Photographic Arts Council Los Angeles. I welcome you today from Los Angeles, and we're so happy to have you here to learn about a very unusual photo archive project, which should be fascinating to anyone interested in photo archives and the enduring power of photography. PAC LA is committed to an evolving conversation inviting the people of Los Angeles and beyond to be engaged, inspired, and empowered by photography and photo-based art. We recognize photography as a primary visual language of our time as it connects us to one another and pushes the boundaries of our understanding. I'm here today with Paul C. Squasis, the creator of the Indigenous Archival Photo Project, George LeGrady, Distinguished Professor of Digital Media at UC Santa Barbara, and Zeb Sheikh, the Consul General of Canada, based here in Los Angeles. Paul is going to present his project to you today in conversation with George, and George will also talk about the history of his James Bay work and how he came to make photographs in Canada during his very early formative years as a photographer. Zabe will introduce our guests in a few moments. Please don't hesitate to use the chat feature below and send us your inquiries in the question column. Following the conversation, we will shift to a Q&A and do our best to get to answer as many questions as time allows. A little background now on our speakers. Paul C. Squasis is a Willow Cree writer, journalist, curator, and cultural advocate based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, from where he is speaking with us today. In 2014, he created the Indigenous archival photo project that explores history, identity, and the process of visual reclamation through photography and dialogue. Inspired by the designating devastating findings of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission report on the historically discriminatory residential school system of 1890 to 1996, Paul sought to uncover the untold history of how indigenous people and communities held together during these difficult times. By scouring libraries and archives, Paul uncovered candid images and began to post these photographs on social media where they sparked an extraordinary reaction. Friends and relatives of the individuals in the photographs commented, and through this dialogue, rich histories began to emerge. These many inspiring stories have resulted in a beautiful publication, Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun, Portraits of Everyday Life in Eight Indigenous Communities. The book is published by Alfred Knopf Canada and is available online and through your favorite independent bookseller. In addition to being a professor, George Legrady is a published photographic artist, author, and scholar whose practice and research explore the potential of digital processes for fine art practices. He's a pioneer in the integration of computation with fine art photographic practices, and his projects explore how contemporary technology can transform visual content to result in new kinds of representations. And aside about George today, he's a leader in forward-thinking technologies but we're going to be looking at photographs he made back in 1972 and 1973 when he was a budding young photographer with an icon f so i'm really very excited for this talk i'm so glad you're all here to share with us and now i would like to turn this over to zabe who will introduce our guests thank you zabe thanks so much marjorie really appreciate being part of this program so looking forward to the discussion and it's important for Canada uh, to be here, uh, a part of this discussion, and as the Consul General for Canada in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada, it's my great honor to be part of this discussion. Uh, Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has unequivocally stated publicly that no relationship is more important to him and to Canada 
than the one we have <laughs> with our indigenous peoples. And while that is an amazing statement, the context around that statement is that Canada's history with Indigenous peoples has been incredibly harmful. Um, in 2011, the government of Canada apologized specifically for the horrors of its residential school program. And the residential school program were government-funded, church-run schools that operated for hundreds of years into the 1970s and beyond separating Indigenous children from their parents in order to weaken family ties and cultural linkages. And as well as being centers of physical and sexual abuse, residential schools were part of a program to erase Indigenous life from Canada, and it was no less than what we now think of, call, and should have always called cultural genocide. So the work that we're sharing today that Paul is sharing with you and George and Paul are going to talk about, as you can see, the cover of Blanket Toss Under Midnight Sun is a project, a process, and a journey um, that looks deeply and tenderly into Indigenous communities and families that endured this kind of horror. Um, it's a beautiful name for the book, um, as far as we're concerned because it speaks not just to the horrors that were inflicted, of course, but it speaks to the humanity, as Marjorie was talking about, and we'll hear more of, the humanity that the photos show of community members. This isn't about the horrors, this is about the community. And Paul's work to recover and literally say the names of the people in the photographs has helped tremendously to undo the, frankly, erasure of First Nations Métis and Inuit lives that we know. We're grateful at Canada and the consulate for Paul's work and the crowdsource histories that he's uncovered. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. These visual stories for us are firmly part of the Canadian experience. And by remembering and understanding them, Canada can better meet our global right to persist that historical wrongs are righted and that we move forward with indigenous peoples together in the spirit of reconciliation. So now I'm going to introduce the actual um, main content, the main event today, both George Legrady um, and Paul. Uh, George was born in Budapest, immigrated to Montreal during the 1956 Hungarian uprising and relocated to California in 1981. He, as Marjorie said, is an internationally exhibited and published artist, author and scholar and a prof at UC Santa Barbara. And his own images, which is what's such an interesting story that where these two met, essentially, George's own images of the four James Bay Cree communities in northern Quebec are actually featured in Paul's book. So without further ado, I'll now pass it over to George and Paul. Thank you so much for having us be a part of it. Thank you so much, uh, Zabe. And it's great to have the uh, Consul General of Canada uh, present in this uh, event. Also, thank you to Marjorie and the Los Angeles Photographic Arts Council for uh, introducing this work to the community. And um, the, uh, the project um, ha you know, has been a, a major uh, importance to me, mostly because it introduced my, my photographs to the, to the community as well. So I wanna jump right in and uh, we'll, we'll ask Paul a number of questions and at the end of the, that set, we'll then um, present, I will present uh, the photographs and the project that I did up in James Bay. So Paul, tell us about the archive. Tell us about how it came to be, what the inspirations were. Uh, pleasure, George, and it's good to see you again. Um, it began roughly about five years ago, uh, six years ago, around the time of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was a commission going across, uh, across Canada, holding hearings with survivors of residential schools, one of whom was my uh, mother, who was a witness at a hearing that took place in Saskatchewan. And she, after she came home from that hearing, she made a comment that uh, while she was glad all this stuff was coming out about residential schools, what was missing in the media, in her view, was the strength and resilience of Indigenous <laughs> communities uh, through the hardest of times and how it was the strength of family, kinships, 
uh, that kept language and culture alive. So I began to think about that and began to look for evidence of that. And uh, since we live in a visual age, I was looking for uh, photographic evidence mm -hmm. primarily. So I began to go through archives, uh, museums, historical societies, looking for uh, pictures that framed an alt alternate reality to the indigenous experience. One that wasn't framed on just the tragic, but was framed on strength and humor and uh, living off the land of, of culture, language, family. And I began to f uncover photo photographers who, uh, whose work had been archived, who had been in these communities and taken these photos. And they ranged uh, gen mostly from the 1940s up to the 1970s was the time period I was looking at. And as I began to unearth these photos, I began to post them online and then through social media began to have this incredible response, uh, which I wasn't anticipating. People began to recognize people in the photos. They began to name them. They began to say where that photo was taken. And through that, we began a kind of, I guess, an oral uh, reclamation of the photo itself. And the photos in a way came alive again for me. Uh, I'm gonna to switch to my um, PowerPoint. So um, this gives you an idea, this gives the audience an idea of, of the kind of photos that you've come across. And uh, how did, I mean, so you went to archives, but um, how else did you come across the photos? Did people submit photos to you once you started the archive project? Not, not, at, not initially, George, but that happened, I'd say within two years. Um, Initially, it was archives, then it began to uh, uh, go into museums, libraries, and as the project became more well known on social media, I began to uh, get queries from people who had private collections, say their father had been a doctor up north or in these communities and had taken photos <laughs> on his own. So I began to get these private collections. So it really expanded beyond archival photos to people's own collections, and then eventually people began to send in their family photos. So I, it sort of became a huge, you know, we're talking after a couple of years or hundreds of photos. So I quickly learned that I needed to have some sort of organization to keep track of all of this. So that was kind of the next challenge for me. And um, I also worked in partnership with uh, Project Naming, which is a initiative of Library and Archives Canada, excellent initiative to name some of the photos from the far north. So partnerships began to happen on both uh, provincial and national levels. And I also began to do some work with nor Northern states and Alaska as well. So it quickly grew into uh, a much larger project than I originally had imagined. So you um, selected four photographs to uh, talk about. And the uh, first one is actually a photograph I took back in uh, 1973. Can you, I got the photo, but you got the story. Can you share? Uh, the chap with the stick in the hat is Oliver Rupert, and he is the lead singer guitarist for a group, uh, which out of Fort George at the time, is, as you would know, George, uh, called the Fort George Rockers. And I think, George, you took this photo in 73, the Fort George Rockers uh, formed in 72, so just the year before. And they're probably the first and only uh, rock and roll band that I know of that did a, a tour. And these communities are on James Bay. So at that time, uh, it was summer, so there's, there was no winter road. So the only way to travel uh, to these communities was flying, which was very expensive, or by boat. So uh, the Fort George Rockers did their first rock and roll tour in uh, long canoes with uh, 24 horsepower motors, and they just packed their gear or guitars and drums into that. I think there were around 24 people on the tour and they went along the bay. Uh, and on that tour, they ran into some storms. So they ended up a couple of times having to uh, seek shelter on islands. Uh, during the tour on one island in particular, they were overrun by hundreds of mice. So it was, <laughs> I think it was a very uh, interesting and historic, it should go down in rock and roll archives. Hmm. I just want to point out that uh... In the book, uh, it says that the the photograph wasn't posed. And if I re remember back, it's nearly 50 years. I think I was just walking on the road, and I see these four guys coming my way. 
And I just said, hold it, hold it. Can I take a photo? And that's how the that's photo awesome. came, to, came to be. And I should just add on to that, George, that the Fort George Rockers are still still going on. And uh, of course, Oliver's a bit older now, like we all are, but he's still uh, playing and singing. So that's it's still, they're still a lot, they're a long lived rock band. So I think this photo was, what do you think, 1940s? Uh, this one was taken uh, 51, 51. Uh, by John McPhee, who was a photographer who worked in northwestern Ontario, a huge expansive territory. And he was by a place near Osnaburg, and uh, he heard about this woman, woman who uh, came into town only once a year to uh, pick up her social security check and pick up some uh, supplies from the local Hudson's Bay uh, Company store. At that time, Hudson's Bay Company store eventually became Northern stores where the main place where he went to get supplies. So he heard about this woman who was coming into town who lived off the land year round. So he's curious and he went down to the lake to, uh, to meet her when she was happened when she was coming in. And uh, they met and he took these photos. Um, she spoke uh, no English and uh, John McPhee spoke a little Cree but no Anishinaabe and she was uh, Ojibwe or Anishinaabe herself. So they kind of communicated with sign language. And he took these photos. That's her nephew in the front of the canoe. And the canoe is a birch bark canoe that she built and repaired herself. So she is uh, quite a remarkable woman. Uh, uh, they just spent a couple hours together as he took these photos. And there's a series probably around a dozen photos that I'm aware of. Uh, this is one of the more interesting ones because it's actually in color, in Kodachrome. And um, after that, uh, he never saw her again. And uh, she probably, you know, spent many more years after that, hopefully living off the land. So it's just one of those interesting uh, examples of where a photograph and John McPhee happening, happening to be there. We know about this woman who we probably would never, none of us would ever know about otherwise. So I find that interesting. It's not just fame, you know, famous people or people we read about in books. It's those people who, through the accident of photography and freezing that image, become known to us. So I, I love that aspect of the story. I just want to uh, build on that a little bit. So when we came to Canada in 1956, uh, my brother and I ended up in uh, French school. And as part of the history, we were uh, taught how the, you know, when the French arrived, they they had to learn to survive from from the, the First Nation people. And uh, one of the things I remember clearly was was how how to make a birch bark canoe. Uh, and I've seen photos of uh, Fort George from the 1900s where, where there was uh, birch bark canoes. But uh, by 1951, I think most people had, were purchasing the canoes, they were commercial canoes, purchasing them at the Hudson's Bay Post. So, so this is a remarkable piece of evidence that here's this person who on her own was still kind of building her own uh, means of transportation. Yeah. Now this um, this person had an interesting uh, story, and you, and uh, so can you tell us about him and the story behind it? Yeah, it's quite an incredible story, and I'll just unfortunately uh, we don't have the time for me to. I could probably go on half an hour on his story alone, but this is Jacob Partridge. The, photo, the pho photograph was taken by Rosemary Joliet e Eaton, who was one of the first uh, women uh, photojournalists in Canada. And she took this photo, uh, would have been 1960 or a little bit earlier than that in Northern Quebec, in a territory that we now call Nunavik. And it's an Inuit territory in Quebec. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Jacob Partridge, uh, uh, when he was a young boy, uh, came down with an illness and his family was concerned. So they took, a, they took him to the local Hudson's Bay Company uh, trading post. And these trading posts usually had a nurse in residence there. So the nurse quickly looked at Jacob and saw that he would need treatment in the South. So, uh, uh, but Jacob's parents didn't speak uh, English and the nurse didn't speak uh, enough to took the Inuit language. So, they had trouble conversing. And uh, at that time, Inuit were given what were called quote unquote Eskimo tags, which were numerical tags that they wore, which was the government's way of identifying who people were. 
and Jacob's mother couldn't find his tag, uh, but then he saw he had one in his hand, but it wasn't his tag, it was, it was uh, his nephew's tag. So he got misnamed, and then he was flown south, uh, I believe to Montreal. Uh, he, first he had TB, and then uh, they found he had a problem with his hip, so he went, had his hip operated on. And he actually spent seven years in, uh, in the south uh, re recuperating, and then he was fine, but they didn't know where he lived. And he was too young at the time to name his community from when he was sent down. So he was stuck in the south until uh, a nurse uh, heard about his last name, Partridge, and put, kind of put two and two together. And uh, uh, when Jacob was in hospital, he was taken sit and shown a map. And he had never seen a map before, uh, but he, his favorite color was blue. And one of the towns in Northern Quebec was shown as being blue. And he pointed at that town and it just happened to be his own hometown. So all these things came together. And eventually seven years later, he was flown home. The whole community knew he was coming home uh, and they were all out there uh, waiting for him. So um, after that, he lived a, a good life. I had a chance to uh, interview him shortly before he passed when I was working on the book. And he was, it's just a very interesting and marvelous story. And uh, this photo is when he was uh, 16. So he'd, he'd been home about uh, nine years already. Amazing story. And how about this one? This is, we're going up to another part of Canada, uh, Yukon, just uh, south of Alaska. And this is Emma Alfred. And the photo was taken in 1951 by uh, Catherine McClellan, who was an uh, anthropologist and linguist who went up to do work with, uh, with Indigenous people in the Yukon. And she happened to take a picture of what was a beaver foot purse that uh, Emma Alfred is holding. And you can see her mom in the background in the in the summer tent there. They're on a summer uh, fishing camp or something. And so Catherine got, a, got, to take a, got her to pose holding the, uh, the purse, the beaver foot purse that mm -hmm. mom had just made for her. A couple of years later, the purse was uh, sold. Uh, they lost track of to who. And so Emma Alford just assumed she would never see the purse again. In, uh, in uh, 2004, 15, Emma Alfred, who was had now grown up to be work in uh, with uh, anthropology and uh, indigenous languages, was invited down to Ottawa as part of a fact finding uh, uh, group to look through some artifacts at the Canadian Museum of History. And while there, and walking through the museum to go look at the artifacts under a glass case, what should she see but the actual purse itself? So it was this uh, amazing. Uh, coincidence of things coming together. And now, of course, the next step was to retrieve the person, have it come back to its own community. So it's one of those issues where the, the photograph led to the reclamation of the object you see in the photograph itself. So I think that's a nice kind of layered aspect of that story. Great, great story. Um, so many of the uh, photographs in the book were taken by um, outsiders and, uh, or visitors, including myself. Um, but I thought we should uh, feature some of the some of the um, um, few indigenous photographers themselves. And um, uh, on the, in the top row, we have a person named Peter Pitzolak who uh, came across Robert Flaherty when he made his film *Nanook of the North* in 1922. I think Peter was was uh, 10 years old or so. Um, do you have any stories about how he managed to uh, develop film and, and get a yeah, camera Peter, and things like that? Uh, Peter was uh, certainly the first uh, Inuk photographer and uh, along with his wife, uh, Ejo, uh, they, uh, they took photo, photo, photographs together. He uh, a missionary, uh, would have been in the uh, mid mm -hmm. to late forties. Uh, and he began to take uh, photographs. Uh, a lot of them of, because life was changing very quickly at the time too. Uh, you know, it was still primarily dog teams, et cetera, but snowmobiles and stuff were starting to come, come to usage, et cetera. So Peter wanted to, Peter and his wife wanted to capture these things, but uh, he quickly ran into an issue of how to develop film because to develop film at the time was a long and 
very expensive process because he would have to ship them south and you know it take weeks or months and then the cost and then to get them back so he didn't want to do that so along with uh, AGIOC they set up uh, in an igloo they set up an actually actual uh, makeshift uh, darkroom using a red cloth uh, I'm not sure where they got the chemicals but they made their own makeshift darkroom and then Peter uh, learned how to develop his own film so it's it was, it's really an interesting uh, uh, story, not just uh, Peter as a photographer, but uh, the inventiveness, inventiveness of finding ways to develop your own film when you're, uh, when, you know, the conditions and where you are in this isolated community make uh, the normal means prohibitive. So uh, I thought that was wonderful. And as you can see the one photo there, he took a lot of, he also pioneered a lot at the app the art of selfies up north. You know, a lot of his photos are selfies themselves, time selfies. I think that's quite charming. Uh, down at the bottom left corner is James Jerome. He was, uh, that's more recent. He passed away in 1979. He only was with us 30 years, but he was a Gwich'in photographer in the north. And one of the, I guess, of the modern era, uh, uh, first uh, indigenous photographers. Uh, there were like Peter in the 40s and also the chap with you see with the red book cover there, George Johnson was a Klingit photographer uh, who began in the late 40s, 50s to take uh, photographs of day-to-day -day life in his community. So these are interesting uh, photographers because they are really breaking ground for what for not, uh, indi what Indigenous photography is today. And of course now today in both Canada and the United States, we have dozens of, of uh, Indigenous photographers who are doing great work. I, I was uh, particularly interested in uh, James Jerome's photographs. There, I think there's 9,000 black and white negatives or images in an archive in the Northwest Territories. Yeah, he, he was, a, in his time, he was a very prolific photographer. And fortunately, the archives acquired them. So uh, I just want to uh, come back to this, this uh, collection of things. Are you the person in the upper right corner? I can't see the upper right corner. Uh, no, let me, let me. I'm, I'm, uh, it's behind me. <laughs> okay, there's a young man with a camera with a longish hair. Uh, I still can't see it, George. Oh, okay. Here, I'm, um, okay, we'll skip it then. I don't want to play with this <laughs> there because I don't want to mess things up on my yeah. Okay, so, and then the last, last topic is um, how this eventually became a curating activity for you. Yeah, there's been, uh, it, it has become that, George, there's been several exhibitions uh, in Canada. Uh, and what, what's happened is, I've, is we've taken some of the photos from the book uh, itself and uh, had them mounted and framed as part of an ex exhibition. And there's a screen, uh, a PowerPoint aspect to it as well. But then we tie it in with local photos that aren't in the book uh, from, uh, from that region or community, indigenous photos. So what usually happens is a few months before the exhibit, I'll go to that, to that town or that community and spend a time in the library, the archives, meeting people and gathering together what local photos I, I can find. And then we we wed those with the photos from the book. So it's kind of a neat in that there's the uh, book side of it, but there's also a very local side to the exhibitions. And there's been uh, four exhibitions up to date. And hopefully once we're through these uh, pandemic times, this, this part of the project will continue. Thank you, Paul. So uh, uh, we'll come back to at the end of my presentation. Wonderful. And if the audience has questions, uh, yeah, please send them. So I want to um, change PowerPoints. Uh, I'm going to switch to uh, some examples of my project. And I, and I want to start with a, um, a map of Canada, just to kind of give an idea of where these photographs were taken. Um, all, the, um, all the green dots with the uh, arrows are where uh, the chapters that Paul describes in his book uh, occur. I don't see the pictures yet, George. Oh, you can't see it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, why is that? I don't know. Did you share screen and then click it? Yeah, I'll try that.
Thanks. Sure. How was that? Sure. That's it. No, yeah, we can. So, uh, you know, as I was saying, uh, the green, green dots and the green arrows represent uh, the communities in, in the book. And each, each community has a chapter in the book. And for James Bay, which is at the lower right corner and in where it says Quebec, province of Quebec, um, I've been honored by Paul, including my photographs. And so I just want to kind of walk through that a little bit. Uh, first of all, the photographs um, that I took in 1973 uh, took place in four locations, which are the four blue dots that you can see there. And I traveled with uh, three other photographers, my brother Miklos, uh, Lillian Sly, and Louise Turner. And we, I was there for three months. Uh, these four dots are locations where the um, uh, Hudson's Bay Company set up meeting points for the fur trade in the 1670s. And they, they eventually became communities. In 1972, the, um, one, of the, one of the Cree was reading the newspaper and discovered that the government of Quebec had plans to flood uh, much of their hunting territory. And I've kind of identified that area with the red, red rect rectangle. And so there was a lot of uh, uh, press about this. And, um, and so um, it became uh, a major uh, focus point, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I just want to go through some of the photographs. Nettie Blackboy, uh, she's sitting in a teepee and, and Take a look at the ground. It's made up of, uh, uh, I think, birch or pine branches. And like, like the way uh, sheets are, are changed every couple of weeks, they would, uh, they would change the, the, the ground covering. So every two weeks, you'd have a fresh uh, ground cover. So we talked about this. Uh, one of the... Uh, this is a photograph taken down by the East Main River. Uh, East Main at the time was a, a community of population 300. And as was the situation, um, I think the band manager was told in advance that I would show up. And, and once I would show up, I, it was up to me to figure out how to, how to negotiate my relationship with everybody in the communities. So, you know, by the look of this photograph, the, you know, uh, common ground has already been set. And so, um, you know, here I'm kind of walking and they're walking towards me and I lift my camera. And so there's a kind of like banter going on. This is a photograph at a wedding in Weminji, uh, another smaller community. And uh, the Hudson's Bay Company brought in uh, individuals from, from Northern Scotland, from Orkney and Shetland Islands. And one of the things they brought with them was their culture of music. And so over time, the Cree began to um, learn, learn um, you know, Scottish fiddle music. And um, this tradition persists to this day, even though now there's also hip hop up in uh, James Bay. But uh, uh, here at the wedding, um, Bobby George Kish is playing fiddle, and the woman with the hat, her husband, is behind on the left playing accordion. So uh, here we're out in the bay, and Rusty Chizo is in the front, and I think he just uh, caught a, a Canada, Canada goose. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got some gossip from up north that uh, Rusty, uh, who, who at some point was also chief of East Main, he won the uh, $1 million lottery, the Quebec lottery. So uh, that was big news a couple of years ago. So in addition to uh, 
including some of my photographs in, in, the, uh, in the book, I'm also featured. So here's a photograph of me <laughs> looking a little different back in 1973. And um, I had a very systematic way to photograph, but every so often we would put the cameras down and, and invariably somebody would pick up the camera and take a photo. So that's how this, this photograph came to be. So how did a how did a 20-year-old white man, hippie, long-haired hippie, end up, end up in James Bay? Uh, I was sitting in a bar and I started to talk to the man to my right, and he told me that he's working for uh, getting the non-status Indians registered so they could get the benefits that the status Indians get. And he said, well, we need photographs. And I said I was a photographer. And so that's how a week later I was up in the north and the photographs I took on that first trip ended up in an exhibition four months later. The, the exhibition opened in January 6th. Um, within, uh, just after the exhibition closed, the article on the right uh, in the New York Times came out, January 26th, and the New York Times described the situation of what was going on in Northern Quebec as a struggle, struggle between David and Goliath. And it was exactly that. Uh, the second person on the left in the photograph is um, Chief Billy Diamond, who was my age at the time. And, uh, uh, he was chief of Rupert's house, but eventually founded the Grand Council of the Cree to represent um, all the Cree communities in northern Quebec. And eventually he ended up leading the negotiations with the premier, Robert Bourassa, we see on the left. So since that time, there's been a number of um, revisiting of the negotiations, but uh, I think the Cree were able to um, negotiate at a legal level uh, without any legal training. And that's an extremely impressive uh, outcome. So I took 2,800 photographs and in my mind I had a, a set of topics and of course the topics increased as I went along. I came to the experience knowing about Robert Frank, about Walker Evans, about, about Margaret Board White and the, the uh, social uh, farm security photographs of the 1930s. And uh, what you see here is a set of groups. The groups are three by three, so a collection of nine groupings and each with a theme. So I th eventually I came up with about 27 themes such as uh, indigenous practices, social get-togethers, weddings, hunting, photography, housing. And most of the, the images I did were in black and white, but I did have uh, some uh, colored rolls with me. And so here are some examples of that. So what made it possible for me to get up north as well was, um, a photography class at Loyola College that my brother and I started to audit or hang out at. And the photographer named John Max, Canadian photographer who recently passed away, um, went up to Mistassini, which is one of the Cree communities, and took some photos. And this, this uh, kind of provided a kind of uh, poetic guidance to, to follow in his footsteps. Also, in the late 60s and, and 70s, um, the media, media of, of, of uh, uh, Port-a-Pack video and photography became recognized by the counterculture as, um, as a tool for social change. And here we have uh, Marshall McLuhan's book on the left. Um, the woman with the Port-a-Pack on the right uh, did a, was part of a documentary in a poor working class section of Montreal. And The Ballad of Crowfoot by um, First Nations um, singer and writer 
Willie Dunn to, was made into a film by the National Film Board that had a program called Challenge for Change. So I think Paul came across uh, my works online. And at this point, I have to mention that, that I started to write grants around 1986. And I was not successful in getting funding until 2012 when the National Science Foundation, Arctic Social Science, came through and uh, came up with a, a significant budget so that I could digitize the selection of the photographs. And I could also then uh, create an online database that's currently online available. And, and also finance two return trips to James Bay. And I, I travel with uh, Andres Burbano. Uh, he, he did the videography you can find on the database. So while I was up in um, Wiminji, uh, I, I went on the radio and I started to talk about the collection and then all of a sudden the phone rang and, and a lady said, I got photos too. And her photographs are the fifth column on the right. So we, we met. Her name is Mary B. George Kish. She's she's a school was a school teacher, and she she created a photographic archive, systematically documenting how the Cree prepare their food. And on the far right is another collection by another Wiminji um, uh, First Nation person, Beverly Mayapo. And Mary B is in the far left in the black and white photograph behind the hand with the cigarette, that's her. And going through the material, it was interesting to come across some coincidences, like for instance, here, her picture is the Polaroid, the color Polaroid in the center, and my photograph is the, the one on the right. So taken a few minutes apart. So one of the themes that I uh, that came to be out of the uh, the visit was um, in Rupert's house. Ch the chief Billy Diamond asked me and asked his brother George to go around and uh, visit every elder of the of the community to have a photograph taken of the of those individuals and uh, as a way to kind of historicize them and to kind of pay respect to the elders. And so this was the outcome of that. So this is from uh, 2012 and 2014 return trip. On the far left, there are three photos. The middle one, um, the lady in the middle there, very small with glasses, Margaret Fireman. She's um, was the uh, director of the Cultural and Heritage Museum in Chisassabee. And, and I'm giving presentations. Uh, the, the middle image, middle images show pictures then and now. The top one is uh, Gordon Niacapo uh, in a teepee and standing next to his friends in the middle. And Gordon below that, who's now a DJ, the photograph below that is a lady looking at herself 40 years ago. Uh, the photo to her right, uh, uh, the black and white photo of the young, young man with the Gilligan's hat is um, today chief, or was chief Dennis George Kish, who's then further on the right. Above that is uh, George Diamond with the blue headband in 1973. And today uh, managing the working in the social health uh, program. And on the top uh, from the 2012, we printed out small photographs as a way to, to um, carry and engage conversation of, of uh, to identify who are the people in the photographs. So, um, uh, Marjorie or Bailey can post the links to these photographs. There, you know, there's a lot of of um, images, and um, and I'm really grateful to the National Science Foundation for making it possible. And I'm also grateful to the communities who were uh, 
who accepted me when I, when I went there and also to the individuals who, who I socialized with and, uh, and the, the uh, project that came to be and now is in parts of it are uh, represented in Paul's book. So to conclude, I want to end up with uh, uh, some historical material and Paul can kind of pick up the conversation here. So I asked Paul about, you know, Willow Cree, that's, that sounds like a very poetic and interesting name. But in fact, in fact, the history is much more dramatic. Uh, can, you, can you say a few things about these photos? Oh, certainly, George. Uh, and thank you for in, your interest. Uh, the photo on the left uh, with the, the young men around the drum was taken in 1891. Uh, standing third from the left with, you can see a sort of, he has a white uh, cloth tied around his uh, left leg, mm -hmm. is my great great grandfather. He was uh, one of the uh, warriors from uh, Beardy's band. Uh, the band was named after the chief Beardy. Who uh, he was at the Battle of Bictos, which was the final battle of the uh, real resistance in Saskatchewan, and he was shot in the leg. So he he often wore that cloth in the years after that battle. Uh, I think it had something to do with pr the pressure on his leg. Um, he is also in that painting, which we didn't find out about uh, till later, uh, painted by Nicholas uh, de Gramaison, uh when he traveled through. Uh, 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 the the plains of both uh, United States and Canada. Uh, of course, he, the name isn't spelled correctly, but there were many variations of the spelling of the name. And uh, Beardy's band and the Willow Cree are interesting because they were deemed a hostile band. So um, they did not have chief and council until the 1930s. For a number of years, uh, they were denied all things promised in the treaty, and that included food and supplies and medicines for men, women, and children. So the community had really hard in the, uh, in the ensuing years after the uh, resistance, but uh, I'm proud to say it's a strong community now and uh, strong and also proud of you know, my own family's history. So uh, yeah, it's an interesting history and I'm glad you picked, it up, picked up on it, George. Thank you, yeah. So this is where we um, move on to the, the next phase, which is the question and answer. So oh, I think this is fabulous. I could start right here. Uh, did you own this photograph for a long time? Has this been in your family, Paul? No, we don't actually have the original photograph. It's, on, it's in archives. So we don't, we have, uh, you know, we print out copies of it, but the actual photo, photograph itself was held in archives. The, that beardy one. And also there is a resemblance, interestingly enough, with that <laughs> painting, uh, I think between uh, in your family, a family resemblance, don't you think? Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm ready to hear, to, to hear that. I think it's a really wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you for sharing so many of those, uh, so much you learned about those individuals. I wonder, um, George mentioned when he went back, I think he said 2012 or 2014, did you ever, were you ever prompted to have meetings or groups like that to share? photos with individuals to try to uh, create a renewal of a community, you know, renew re relationships? Well, the, the, uh, I was going to, Paul, did you ever do that? Uh, oh. I have, um, sorry. Oh, no, no problem at all. Uh, yes. Uh, a lot of the, the, a lot of stuff I've done is really been because the photos are so spread over a diverse geographical area. Uh, unlike George, you know, being sort of implanted, in a community for uh, for weeks upon weeks to take photos. I'm kind of archiving from across a large territory. So most of my uh, communication, visual reclamation or naming, if you will, uh, figuring out stories that go behind the photos, I would say 90% 90, 90 of that has taken place online through social media. People starting uh, conversations about the photos and then that conversation eventually leads to constructing a, a oral narrative that goes along with the visual image. So most of my stuff, unlike being in the community, has been online. Got it, got it. And these color images, they're holding up? Yours, George, and yours, the ones you find, Paul? Because that's always an interesting uh, <clears throat> to see when you look at 50-year-old photos. 
Well, mine were digitized from negatives, so um, ah, so they're they're digital. And yours too, the ones you would find also, Paul. Yeah, the ones I found, uh, the majority are digitized already through archival sources. Though I had had original prints sent to me since then from private collections. So once I've received those, I quickly look at a way to ensure that they're, you know, that the preservation of those uh, prints are are done as best as they can be. And I've actually returned some of those, a uh, couple of print collections to communities had, that had not seen those prints before. So that's oh, also that's... giving the actual originals back to the community. Uh, you, have to, it, you have to be careful to have, to have to make sure that there's a place at the other end where they can be received and stored properly. So right. once right. we determine that, we, we go ahead to the next step. Yeah. We have me, a question. Maybe what... I, can I add something? Yes. Uh, I should add that. Uh, you know, after Mary B uh, introduced us to her photographs, um, my colleague Andres Burbano actually flew back in October with a scanner and, and spent three days with her ah. she, to, you know, and while he was scanning the images, she was telling stories about them. And she donated that archive or that digital archive to UCSB? Uh, well, there's no, basically, no, she just uh, add, she wanted to um, have the photographs seen or, or remembered or recorded because it, it kind of uh, features a very, very precise uh, sequence of actions of how the food is prepared. And so we were the opportunity by which these could kind of have, have a life of their own. Well, it, it prompts the thoughts about the work you've done, Paul, and how important it might be or the possibility to merge these archives, right? For, to Yeah, my hope is at least with uh, the aspect of the work I've done so far is to have a, a database which will be useful for not just families, but students and future uh, study. Um, it, a lot of the archives, the photos are already archived, so it'd be more like a database with links so that people know, know where to go. It'd be like a roadmap. So yes, that definitely is in the works. That's, that's extremely significant, I, I think. That work you've done is, makes that so valuable, so valuable. There's a question, is there an active photographic scene in these communities that you visited? Um, I'll, about. I'll jump in. Yeah, certainly uh, there is now. Uh, I know there's several uh, photography clubs clubs that have been set up in different indigenous communities in Canada. And I know there are, uh, there are a number of indigenous photographers, both in Canada and the United States now, who are based in their communities, who are doing uh, photography, sometimes as photojournalism, et cetera. So certainly that uh, has really, I think that scene has really grown in the past uh, few years. Yeah particularly with social media, because it raises your profile as a photographer. And are people posting their own images on social media in response to yours? Uh, that happens on occasion, yes. Yes, it does. That's amazing. Also, here's another question. Uh, what's the fastest turnaround time on getting an identification when you post on Twitter? She's enjoying the naming, and, and that's quite a significant exercise to do naming. Yeah, um, I think the just to answer that question quickly, the fastest I'd had was on actually on Facebook. I'm not on Facebook right now, I'm taking a Facebook break, but on Facebook, uh, and I would say within five minutes, we had the identification. Because once, I soon had thousands of followers, so once I posted something, people were, it's almost like, it began to happen very quickly. So sometimes it was a, a, within minutes. Wow. So here's another question. In a world where just about everybody has a camera in their pocket, how do you encourage amateur photographers to think about the ethical use and capture of photos of other people, particularly in reference to indigenous people? Because that may be a sensitive area. I think, uh, well, I'll let George jump in on that as a, as a professional photographer. And then if I have anything to add after George. Okay. So, uh, so one of the uh, ways that I, I uh, managed to create the photographs I did was, uh, initially being invited, uh, you know, professionally and, and in 72 and in 73, uh, asking to be invited. So we contacted Billy Diamond 
and basically we had a job to do, uh, which was to create visibility for the Cree in the South. So, so in some sense, that's how, how I managed to create those, those photographs. Um, today, today, and I'll answer the question a little differently. Today, the, each of the communities are actively engaged in uh, collecting their cultural history. So each community has uh, cultural museums where um, you know, people are collecting stories and collecting artifacts and collecting photographs. And, and it's a rare, basically the four communities that I visited, you can't really just walk in because you know, it's up north. Uh, there are no uh, other people around except for the people who, uh, who work on the, on the hydroelectric project or who come in for medical you know, or any, any other kind of service. So they're coming in sent by the government. So you, you don't have people coming in and just taking pictures like right. let's say in Taos, New Mexico. And so I don't... And just to add to George, what George said, I think that uh, process is happening in a lot of indigenous communities now of reclaiming history. So I just wanna say there's much more of an awareness of that. And also I think uh, a sense of uh, ownership of, of, of how images mm -hmm. are used. And I think that awareness has certainly grown in the past few years. Well, isn't that a very wide debate in photo circles in, in so many areas, isn't it? Yeah. I wanna read one thing to you. Um, from an attendant, Paul. Pictures are worth a thousand words. You speak to millions, Paul. I had the opportunity to go to Bathurst Inlet Lodge in Nunavut in 2018 and was taken to different inlets and places on a flat bottom boat. They're not taking groups, but I think you are the ideal person to go to Bathurst Inlet. One was called Amasith Point. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. I really appreciate that. Thank you. You know this area she's referring to? I do know the area. I haven't been to the area, but I know the area. Yes. Okay, great, great. So that's just some feedback from a listener. Thank you for that, Ava. Um, let me see if there's a little more. Um, is photography taught to Indigenous students as part of um, curriculums now in Indigenous, in, uh, indigenous communities? Um, I, it's, I think that's a difficult question to answer because it'd be different in different uh, you know, in different regions. Uh, I know there are uh, photography uh, clubs and stuff, uh, but in terms of actually on different reserves or uh, uh, different communities, I'm not aware of too many where there's actually, it's part of the curriculum. I just think in this day and age, you know, that with uh, our accessibility, not just to smartphones, but to social media and that more of these communities now are online and linked that it's inevitable that uh, you go much more, certainly you see it with filmmaking and I think you're seeing that also with the growth in photography. So image creation, I think is definitely uh, on the rise, whether it's being taught or not. Yeah. So maybe I can add something. So when I was up in, uh, up in James Bay in 1973, a number of the people I mentioned uh, actually got inspired and went south and went to uh, uh, photography schools and, and video schools and then came back and started businesses and things like that. And But I was really surprised when in 2014, um, when, on our return trip, uh, we saw that the Cree were, you know, obviously today part of the global culture and they were importing uh, different kinds of experts. And so we met some hip hop experts <laughs> in uh, Chisassibi. So that was kind of funny. Integration, right? Well, I think I want to wrap up. I think it was a marvelous talk. Um, as, as a person that works with, works with archives myself, I have to say, I, at every turn, I get the value of what you both did and have continued to do uh, with photographs. It continues to drive home the value of taking pictures, keeping them, posting them, and the value again of archives. Uh, George, you know, the pictures that you had at UCSB that Paul could find and enhance to include in the book. I wanna show you George, uh, Paul's book, which is my book now. Um, and it's really wonderful. The stories um, 
are sweet and sentimental, yet sometimes they're very um, historically significant. And you and that's that's obvious in the in uh, the marriage between the narrative and the images, which is so important. And that's another reason I find it important that we're able to do these talks with you. I'm thrilled you've been my guest. Is there anything you want to add before we say bye-bye? Um, just I want to thank the uh, Photographic Arts Council of Los Angeles. It's been, it was really a pleasure and to be involved with this. And again, thank you, Marjorie. And thank you, uh, George. It's great to uh, talk to you, even if it's only by Zoom, but by Zoom nonetheless. So thank you yeah. all and all the people who tuned in. Yeah. Yes. Same here. Thank, thank you to everybody for participating, including Zabe. Yes, thank you, Zabe. Um, we're so happy to have the Canadian um, and all the Canadians that joined us today. Uh, check out our website, packlosangeles.com. We're doing very unusual and interesting, provocative photo related talks all the time. I hope you'll join us. Um, signing up for our website is um, free and easy. If you just go there, you'll see join our mailing list and we look forward to speaking to you all again soon and um, check out the book and stay safe everybody okay it's a rough time but we're so glad we could do this with you all thank you thank you thanks bye -bye. everybody bye paul bye, -bye. bye george bye marjorie bye, -bye. Yeah.